Um, I will make this recording available to Roxanne for her to share with everyone um, once my IT department is able to convert it to the YouTube video as is required by our agency. Um, oftentimes that same day, however, I can never make any promises because it really depends upon the IT department. So good morning. Today we are going to talk about um, the personally identifiable information policy of the DCA CDBG DER homeowner rehab program. Um, and so where I'm going to start is I am going to share my screen and I am going to have you all look at our policy, which you will be getting a copy of. So um, can everyone see this fairly OK? I know it's hard to do on screens, um, but I want to make sure that you can at least see what I'm pointing out. Yeah. Yes. OK, great. Um, OK, so the policy itself is only seven pages long. Um, what I will say is that I am not going to sit here today and read this to you. Uh, everyone is capable of reading it on their own. That is an expectation um, after this is over that everyone will do so. What I did do is pull together a PowerPoint presentation that is going to quickly go over some high points of it. So what we have, as I said, is the DR Homeowner Rehab or HRRP program, Personally Identifiable Information PII. So as I think everyone on the call knows, I am Kathleen Tremblay, otherwise known as Kathy. Uh, I'm the CDBG DR program manager and my email address is listed here in the slides, but I do think everyone has it as well. So we're gonna touch upon the key points of the CDBG DR PII policy. And then as I said, everyone will receive a copy at the end of the presentation. So. Basically, we're going to go over the definition of PII, physical, verbal, and electronic security, and disposal methods for PII. The definition, and it's important to note, this is per DCA's subrecipient procedures to protect personally identifiable information for CDBGDR programs is personally identifiable information, PII, refers to information which can be used to distinguish or trace an individual's identity, such as their full name, social security number, including only the last four digits, biometric data, policy numbers, award amounts, income, bank account information, etc. So that is how it was defined in our policy. So when we talk about PII security, when we're talking about physical, we're thinking hard copies. We're talking hard copy files, we're talking documents. And so we need to make sure that access is limited. And that access limitation should also mean, it doesn't mean that everything is shared just because you are one subrecipient. Unless there is a reason or what is called need to know, someone should not have that information. So you may have case managers that are not sharing clients and are, and are not working together on specific cases. One case manager should not be sharing details with another. We need to make sure there's no conflict of interest. So if someone is assigned a case and there could be the appearance of a conflict of interest, the case should be reassigned to someone else. When we're talking about storage, we need to make sure that it is in a locked drawer or cabinet. Now, best practice in this matter is be in a locked drawer behind a locked door. We do not have that requirement, but it is a best practice when we're talking about per PII. And then we need to make sure that anything hard copy physical is disposed of appropriately. So when we talk about verbal, well, we don't think a lot about this, but again, this comes to we should not be sharing between coworkers unless it's necessary. We should limit the type of information we're leaving on voicemails. So if we're calling a client, we should be saying, hello, this is Jane Doe. I'm calling you to follow up on an application you submitted. Please return my call at blah, blah, blah. We don't need to say I'm a case manager. We don't need to say it's about homeowner rehab. We need to limit what we say on voicemails. 
And then we should not be discussing any private information in public locations. So this is a hallway, this is an elevator, this is out at lunch if we're going, you know, over to the diner across the street. We don't want to do that in public. We should make sure that we're having these conversations behind closed doors or where others could not potentially hear us. When we talk about electronic PII, this includes every email, text message, documents attached to emails that could contain information that on its own, maybe it's not PII, but when you combine it with other information, it can be. If possible, if you're going to be working off site, so you're not directly connected to your, we call it an intranet, your server, your, your space, you want to use a VPN if that's possible when you're viewing or sending any information and you're not directly connected to your to Brunswick servers essentially. You want to use encryption whenever possible when you're sending information or in in some cases like you guys have set up an excellent system with the SharePoint system where only certain people have access. Um, another layer of security there could be to make sure that only the appropriate people have access to the appropriate files. So then we're going to move into a little bit about disposal methods. So when you have a hard copy document, whether it's an income document, if it's a birth certificate, if it's simply a receipt for repairs, it's a hard copy document when combined with other information could lead to PII you're going to either return it to the applicant you can shred it so this could be a simple you know shredder from office depot on the side of your desk it could be an industrial strike shredder or it could be a shred box where you have a company that comes in and picks up the shredding and it's outsourced to them another option is burning I don't know that, you know, that I think is something that would be outsourced. I don't advise a, you know, 55 gallon drum in the back of the uh, intake center. And then another way is pulverizing. Now pulverizing is something that's often suggested if you have plastic coated type papers, because what happens is it is essentially put through a, a shredder type deal and then it's forced through a screen. So it's crushed and then it's forced through a screen, which essentially makes it impossible to reformulate that data. When we talk about electronic records, we want to look at permanent ways of getting rid of things. I think we all know that just hitting the delete button on our OneDrive or our SharePoint does not permanently erase something. So we want to make sure if we're trying to erase data that we're using a, a source of permanent data wiping, which can often be done professionally. This is old, but it is in the policy because some people do still, do still use it. But if there's any information kept on CDs or DVDs, those can be the DVD or CD itself can be shredded or burned. Uh, again, burning, I would suggest professional. Uh, those CDs and DVDs can let off some really nasty chemicals when they're burned. For computers or peripherals, such as portable drives, you must use software to make the files non-recoverable. So this goes back to that permanent data wiping. So if you were to end the homeowner rehab program at the end of the three years, and you're gonna reuse that computer for another purpose, you must have it wiped so that no files on it can be recovered. So that comes to the, the brief overview I wanted to do on that. Is there any questions at this point in time? And I'm going to go back to my screen so I can see if there are. All right, so I don't have anything in the chat. Does anybody have any questions they want to just ask? All right, we're all very quiet. So let me pop back to the PowerPoint for a moment. And so the next steps in this process is you are all going to review the subrecipient PII policy. That is the document I pulled up at the beginning of this. Then you will sign the subrecipient PII policy acknowledgement. You will submit them all back to Roxanne and Roxanne, yes, you will sign one as well. And you'll and Roxanne will send them over to me at DCA. 
And this way here, and I'll show you the form that you're going to wind up pulling up or be signing. It basically just it's a certification statement that says that you're acknowledging that you have received, fully read, and had the opportunity to ask questions and fully understand the procedures to protect personally identifying information. Uh, you're agreeing to abide by the terms and conditions of the policy stated in this. So this is what you will read. Seven pages should be quick. And this is what you'll sign. All right. Any questions about any of that? All right, fantastic, fantastic. All right, so the next step in the process is I wanted to talk to everyone about income calculations. There were a lot of questions asked during our um, Q&A session, which I'm really happy about. I'm, I'm glad that you guys are reaching out if there are questions and we're always happy to answer them. And so in reviewing the questions and reviewing some of the information um, in the, app, the draft applications, we decided it was best um, to pull together everyone and just go over exactly how income calculations have to be completed so that we're all doing it the same way. We're all coming up with the same numbers from the, from the information that's provided by the applicants. And we don't have any issues when HUD comes in to do an audit, which they are already starting to talk about. So we expect it will be before the end of this year. Um, so briefly, I have a couple of things we're going to do. I have a presentation that we're going to walk through the types of income calculations that we could see, exactly how to conduct them. And then we are going to walk through the CPD income calculator. Because as I shared with Roxanne after our Q&A session last week, I was not able to replicate the problem or the notices, the error notices that any of you had mentioned when I was in the income calculator. So I want to walk through it. And that way there, we, if the, you're seeing something I'm doing that you didn't, or if you're seeing something which is where you came up with the error message or you're unsure of something, we're all on the same page with that. Okay. Any questions before we get started? Nope. All right. Well, let's move on to income calculations then. So, da -da 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 -da. don't know why I can't see my button, but there we go. All right. So again, my info, income calculation, the how-to guide. So we're going to talk about weekly, bi-weekly, semi-monthly, and monthly uh, calculations. We're going to talk about supporting documentation and a little bit about the CPD income calculator. And then we're going to go into a review of the calculator. So when you're calculating weekly income, and then what you need, required documentation, four consecutive pay stubs. Now, there are always exceptions to every rule. So if you have somebody that comes in and they only just started working and they've only got two pay stubs, you can use the two pay stubs. But if they have been working consistently, you need to get four consecutive recent pay stubs. Your calculation method is you add the four gross pay totals together and I have some samples that I'll show you what you're looking for on these pay stubs. You're going to divide that total by four. This amount is your average. You're going to multiply the average amount by 52 and this is your total annual income. It's important to note when you have a salaried pay stub, so it's the same amount each and every pay period, it does not require the average. You would simply multiply the gross by 52. Bi-weekly. Now here again, we, the required documentation is two consecutive pay stubs. However, if you have a case-by-case -case situation, you can certainly look at different amounts, different pay stubs. This one again, add the gross together. You're going to divide this total by two because you're only working with two pay stubs. You're going to average it and multiply the average by 26. The reason for 26 is because they are paid every other week. So that is then your total annual income. Again, it's the same thing here. Salary pay where it's the same amount each pay period does not require the average. You would simply multiply the gross by 26. 
Calculating semi-monthly income, again, you're looking for two consecutive pay stubs, adding the gross, dividing by two. This time, you're going to multiply the average by 24. This is your total annual income. And the reason for this is because semi-monthly are those people, like state employees, who are paid twice per month. On, you typically on the 15th of a month and the final day of the month. Okay, although it can be the first and the 16th as well. I've seen it that way. It's the same thing here. Salaried pay does not require the average. You simply multiply the gross by 24. Monthly income. So this can be pay stubs or it can be up to date benefit information. So you would want at least two even if it is monthly income because you want to be able to see whether it's the same amount every month or whether it fluctuates. And on benefit letters, it your SSI, SSDI, pension, your TANF, that's going to stay the same. But if you had monthly that was different, and so one month they get $1,000, the next month they get $900, and they say that's pretty average, you're going to do the gross pay again. Divide it by 2 and multiply it by 12. So here's the thing about supporting documentation. It has to be up to date information. So for example, if I had a an applicant coming in today and they were going to provide me pay stubs because they had recently started working to say just this year, 2021, I would not accept a pay stub uh, or consecutive pay stubs from January. I would want to see the most recent four weeks that they had worked. So they don't get paid until Friday. They're coming in on a Tuesday. Okay, so we want last Friday, the Friday before, the Friday before that, so on and so forth. It has to be up-to-date current information. Pay stubs must be consecutive, meaning that I want to see last week, the week before, the week before, the week before that. I do not want to see one from January, one from February, one from March, unless they're monthly. Again, there could be circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis where that would change. It will be rare, but it can happen. If you have any questions about it, you can always reach out to anyone here in the DR department at DCA. So benefit letters should be dated within the past 30 to 90 days, depending upon the type. And this is important because something I'm going to show you as soon as we move to the sample documents that I have, you'll see that I said that something was unacceptable benefit documentation, and I'll explain why. And it's important to note that all scans must be legible and they must allow an auditor to see the relevant numbers, dates, and other information. So when you're scanning things, I know I had to do it several times with my scanner. I scanned something and it was like, oh, that's a little light, maybe I need to darken it up, or there were some weird characters on the screen um, because you know my scanner was being used as a photocopier at the same time. Could be any number of things, but it's important when you're scanning the documents to look at what you've scanned to make sure that everything that's relevant or you think could be relevant is visible. Okay. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to move over to our sample documents. So we're going to start here. So you hey, will Jessica, get copies. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I ask a quick question is Jose before you sure. move over? How it's the rule or how are, are DCA recommend a way of calculating somebody that is self-employed, for example, and their income could be, as we call sometimes, under the table. So, you know, some some they get paid cash, some they might have receipts. So, example, let's say if I'm a gardener and I have some clients that might pay me, I don't know, a, a personal check and I have some that give me cash. So how is the recommended way for DCA to calculate those? Um. So... In all technicalities, if we want, if we go there, income that is not taxed, they should be filling out, technically filling out a zero income certification because we, unless they are actually an independent contractor or self-employed and therefore they should be claiming that information on a tax return. That being said, we know that's not really the case in the real world. What I would suggest at that point is a self-certification of income. 
Okay, and that yeah. means that they would need to sign and have notarized documentation stating that their income from self-employment is such, and they can do it on a per week, a, a by however they determine is the best way to be paid. But in that case, I would say a self-certification of income. Awesome, thank you. Okay, all right, so let's talk about some of these documents. So here we have some really awful but very quickly put together uh, fake pay stubs that are a weekly and so what i did here is i numbered the pay stubs and when i was a case manager this is exactly what i did is if someone brought me a, a multitude of documents i'd labeled my income by this is the first week i'm looking at and so what i did here and i chose a really bad color it, this is actually pink it just didn't come out well in my scan but i highlighted where the relevant information is because as we know these pay stubs can be very complicated and obtain you can have a ton of information that you do not need on here what you're looking for is you're looking for the pay period because that's going to tell you whether this is weekly bi-weekly semi-monthly or monthly okay so your pay period here indicates that this is a one week time frame your current total of 404.25 is your rate of 10.1050 an hour at 38.5 hours. You can also, in many cases, you will actually see the word gross somewhere on the pay stub, and it is 404.25. These are the numbers that matter. The gross pay. The net pay, nope, you can just ignore it. The deductions, you can ignore it. The year to date, you can ignore it. You want the current gross amount. And so in this example, now here we have pay stub number two, they worked 40 hours this week. So their gross was this. And we see it again here. And then third paycheck. So basically each week I made it as this, this person had worked a different number of hours and so had multiple calculations. And this is that calculation where we add all four gross amounts together we divide them by four because that's how many pay stubs we were working with and we multiply it by 52 because that is how many weeks there are in a year okay when we think about bi-weekly pay stubs now this is a real one so all of the relevant information is redacted uh, that could potentially breach pii um, so again we're looking at our pay period here this is indicating it's a two-week pay period and we're looking at our current earnings. As you can see, there's nothing about gross on here, but there is current earnings versus net pay. So this is what we're looking at, the 267.82. Now we have two pay periods and they are consecutive. You'll see that the first pay period ended on one nine. They are not consecutive. Um, yeah, they are. One nine, this one started on one ten. So these are consecutive, so these are good to go. Again, this one is not the same, so we go to our calculation, okay? I do not have semi-monthly, but what you would see on semi-monthly is you would see a pay period that might say 1-1-21 to 1-15-21, and then it would have an amount, and that, you know, you're looking at the pay period to make the determination. Now, when we look at monthly, this one's a little bit more. You were able to see, based upon what the applicant provided, that they had given monthly pay stubs. And the reason being is they provided two, and it was dated for the month. So it's the month end that they're getting their, their pay. And as you can see, this one does say gross pay. That is the amount that you want. And the amounts do fluctuate. Not a lot, but enough that you do need to use your calculation. Now, it's important to note that if if I was doing this income calculation today for an applicant coming in, I would not accept something from 1030 and 1130 2020, because if they are still working, then they should have more recent pay stubs. They should have at a minimum January and February's. Okay. So then let's talk about benefit letters. So this is an excellent example of a valid benefit letter. 
And the reason being is that we know that Social Security benefits, or we should know, Social Security benefits are updated at a minimum, at a maximum, one time per year. So in this case, this says beginning December 2020, the total full monthly Social Security benefit before any deductions is 891.70. This is the number you want. It's going to be right there. You want the full monthly Social Security benefit. We don't worry about how much they're deducting for medical insurance. We don't say worry about how much their payment is. We don't worry about what their past benefits were. We are only concerned with this number here that tells us that they will receive this amount per month of their gross Social Security benefits. Okay. So now back to that thing about what's an unacceptable benefit information. And so this, this is a 1099 form that every Social Security recipient receives, usually by mid-February, sometimes a little bit earlier, if Social Security is on it. And it tells them for the previous year exactly how much in funds they receive from Social Security. No different than any other type of 1099. It's telling us how much we made. Now, a lot of Social Security recipients don't need to do anything with this form because Social Security is their only form of income and therefore is not taxable. Some people will need to use this and they'll need to combine it with other types of income, pensions, maybe they work a part-time job, and they'll have to claim this on a tax return. The reason that as of January 1st, 2021, this form became not acceptable as a benefit statement is because of a lovely thing called COLA, C-O-L-A, Cost of Living Adjustment. Every Social Security recipient in the United States received a COLA beginning in 2021. This is usually a very, very tiny amount. It, I think the average is about 1.6% per year, which for someone making $21,000 a year is probably less than $12 a year. Okay. That being said, HUD requires that we have the most up-to-date income available when we are doing a calculation. So therefore, what they received in 2020 is not relevant when we must use the 24 CFR Part 5 Annual Income CPD calculator. We need the most recent and up-to-date. So that would be why this is unacceptable, okay? So those are the sample documents. I also have a sample um, 1040 that is literally made up. This is not real for anyone, um, but it kind of points out and it's gonna go into play when we look at the CPD income calculator where this information is coming from. And I had sent, and I'm sure she's already sent to given to you the uh, breakdown that shows you know, what number over here on the 1040 form and where it should go on the CPD income calculator. So you will get copies of all of these documents to have for your records, um, as well as the PowerPoints and then this recording. So let's pop on to the HUD exchange. Uh, before I go into this, are there any questions? Oh, Looks Regina, like you Regina have your has hand a hand up. Go ahead, Regina. I just had a quick question. Um, and I understand you're saying that the, um, that the, as of January, of this year um, about that um, 1099 form mm -hmm. and what if um, like a lot of our applicants we um, their cases were basically they turned in their verification everything before then like as of December 31st would that apply to them no if if it was if you were calculating so income it's important to know according to the manual the time that income should be finally calculated is at the time of application submission not intake date 
Okay, so you can collect the information at that point in time, knowing that depending upon the length of time between the initial intake date and the submission of the application, that it may have changed. Now, it should not have changed enough to, you know, necessarily negate someone being able to participate in the program, but it should the the final income calculation should be conducted at the time you're submitting the application. If there is no if there's no changes, then your documentation should be fine. We will be needing to um, for those applicants that have already submitted their their verifications before we submit, we would actually need to gather their income one more time. Yes, yes. If you have applicants that um, that continue the process into a new um, calendar year, then yes. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to the CPD income calculator? All right, not seeing any hands or hearing anything, let's pop onto it. All right, so everybody on this call, for the most part, should be familiar with the HUD exchange. In fact, I hope everybody is familiar with it because it is a wealth of information. But what we are looking for here is the CPD income calculator. Uh, and so once you log in, this is your home screen. You should always be able to get to it right from here. So as you can see, there are a host of programs that use this calculator and each and every one of them has their own forms within it. So when we want to start calculating, we're going to go to our dashboard. So as you can see, your dashboard should hold all of the calculations that you have completed. And as you'll see, mine are all test information. And this is when I was trying to test um, to get the things that you all were dealing with. So I always come up here and I start with select a program and start a new calculation. Now you can come down here and it should bring you to the CDBG disaster ones, but we all know that systems can be glitchy. So I advise starting up here where it says select a program and start a new calculation for CDBG disaster recovery assistance. And so I'm going to hit start. Now, for the purpose of homeowner rehab, there are two options that you can select from this list. Low mod housing is going to be your most popular. This is those households that are 80% or less AMI, area median income. Now, in rare cases, and I have seen several applications like this, you may need to select urgent need. It doesn't mean what it sounds like it means as far as homeowner rehab. These are the people that are between 81 and 120 percent AMI. Now you may not know this until you go into the calculator and it's okay because you can always come back and switch it. Okay for now we're going to select low mod. We're going to assume based upon you know calculations in our head that this client, this applicant, is low to moderate income. So here's a big thing, beneficiary ID. It is very, very important that we note that we do not use any personal information to create that beneficiary ID, including but not limited to names, social security numbers, or addresses. So I know that you all have uh, a numbering system. So my suggestion would be to use the numbering system. In this case, we're going to just call it HRRP01. Okay. You can do this however you need to, but ensure you are not using personal information. We're going to select how many members in the household there are for this test. We're going to say there's two people. So what happens when we click here is that we get number one and we get number two. And again, we should not be using names, social security numbers, addresses, or anything that could identify these clients. So in this case, we are going to call this 01HOH, head of household, 
SP, spouse. Doesn't have to be that. I'm not saying that that has to be what you use, but you've got to come up with a way to identify these members without using names, addresses, social security numbers, last four of social, anything that can identify them. Then we need to select what options we have here. So this member is the head of household. Since this is a spouse, this is a co-head of household. If they're a full time, if they're under the age of 15, if they're under the age of 18, if they are a full time student age 18 or over, if they're 62 or older. So we're going to say that both of our applicant and co-applicant are 62, and we're going to say that spouse is disabled. Okay. Okay. So then, of course, then we're just simply selecting our information. So we are in the state of Georgia. We are looking at Brunswick and we are selecting 80 percent if we believe because we did select low to monitor income. We believe these people are below 80 percent AMI. Now it gives us our information. Great thing about this and Roxanne, this kind of comes back to what you were asking since they don't give us a chart of 120. You can always come in here and look it up. Um, and you could actually make your own table by selecting, you know, one person, finding out what the 120 is, selecting two people, so on and so forth. Um, but we're going to stick with 80% here. Okay. So is this income determination being conducted for housing in which low income housing tax credits are involved? This is a single family owner occupied unit that we are doing. So it should not have anything to do with low income housing tax credits. Okay. So here is where we have to decide which one are we going to use. So are we going to choose someone who had to file a tax return? Or are we going to file, do someone who maybe didn't file a tax return, maybe their income's changed too much? There's a circumstance where we're not. So we're going to start by saying, you know what, this person did not file a tax return in 2019. They are going to file one in 2020, but it, it, they haven't done so yet, okay, because they have until April 15th. So we're going to choose 24 CFR Part 5 annual income. That means we are collecting actual data pay stubs, benefit letters, et cetera, for that. If we had collected their 1040, we would be selecting here, and we will do a, another test for that one. Okay. So you have two options here. You can use the short firm method. Once you're familiar with this form and how you do it, you can certainly select this, or you can use the guided step-by-step. I haven't seen a whole lot of difference in the disaster recovery version of this with the guided, but that's what we're going to select. Okay, so we need to select which person we're going to calculate assets and annual income for. We're going to start with our head of household. Okay, so one of the things that comes up often is what is considered an asset? What do I have to look at? So an asset is anything that they can obtain actual income from. So you see that there's cash, there's equity, stocks, retirement accounts, pension funds, life insurance, personal property, lump sum payments, deeds, checking accounts and savings accounts. Okay. For the most part, our, our low to moderate income people, are they're probably going to have a checking account. So they have a checking account, but maybe they don't collect. Maybe it's one of those checking accounts from, say, Bank of America, where you don't collect any interest whatsoever. So their actual income from that asset is nothing. In that case, you probably don't even have to add that. You can just simply do that. You, you know, you don't click the add asset. If they identify something like that, then you absolutely should. You can always and you can continue to add as many as you need to if they are obtaining some sort of income from the asset. In this case, we're going to continue. They don't have anything but a checking account. So for this one, do we want to add a job for this member? So this is our head of household. So we're going to say, yep, he is that person that's working uh, weekly 
And here we go. So we can simply say uh, job one. His wages and salary are hourly. Okay. $10.50 average hours per week. 52 weeks per year, okay? Doesn't get overtime or bonuses. Check if they anticipate a raise or a COLA increase. So we hit continue. So do we need to add another job? No, we don't. Do they receive benefit or pensions? They don't, their wife does. They don't receive any public assistance. This would be things like TANF. Now, I know that public assistance can also include um, food stamps. We do not include food stamps in an income calculation. Do they earn any other income? No. Okay. So, let me show you the problem with doing it the guided step-by-step -step method. It took my average of 40 hours a week and just calculated it. So in this case, we're going to go delete. And we are going to come over here. And we're going to use go back. We're going to say it's not there. We're going to use that form. And we're going to use the short form method allows us to just put in our own information. Okay, so as you can see, our checking account is still there, and we put in anticipated annual income. Now, the reason why we call it anticipated annual income is because they haven't actually earned it. We're assuming they're going to earn it, because you're always looking ahead on an income calculation. So, in the example of the four pay stubs that I've provided earlier, doing that calculation came out to $20,509.32 per year. Okay. Now, the short form method, we could add another thing if we wanted to, or we move over to the spouse. Spouse doesn't have a checking account of her own. We're just going to add some income for her. She gets benefits or pension. We're going to say SSDI. And her annual amount is $10,700.40. Okay. So here we go. We have the head of household has their income listed at 2509.32 and our spouse has theirs at $10,700.40. So now we press the calculate button. And we come with our page. So it says gives us our beneficiary ID, the number of members in the household, the area we're looking at and what the income limit is for 80%. So there's no actual net cash value of assets. We're simply taking the two amounts here. They're adding up to 31,209.72. And we are getting that, yes, they are eligible. Okay, so this does it for you. It says they could make up to $40,050 per year, and they only make 31,209.72. So they're good to go. Okay, so now you can save and return to dashboard, but what we actually need to do at this point is do export to PDF which creates your signature page. So it shows your assets. It shows your anticipated annual income. And it gives you your signature page. So your head of household needs to sign right here. They need to print right here. If you want to type their name out prior, if you want to type the date, they're going to sign it. Other adults whose income is listed need to sign here. All the way down, they give you plenty of spaces. Printed name needs to be here. Date they sign needs to be here. The person who prepared this needs to sign here. Their printed name here. The date they signed it here. Okay. This is required. 
you must have the head of household and beneficiary adults signatures. So anyone over the age of 18 whose income is listed up here must sign this form. OK. Uh, and then you would. Uh, so obviously you're printing this prior to them signing it and they're signing it. Or if you're using electronic signatures, which is something that can be done now. What we do not want to do is have their first name showing up anywhere else but right here. Okay, and that's only if you cannot come up with a way to identify them. If you want this hard copy for your records, their first name should show up here, but never anywhere in this part of it. Only once you have PDF this form can you put their first name here to identify who that income belongs to if you think it is necessary. It is not required. Okay. So you would then download the form or print the form, have everyone sign and scan it in where it needs to be. Are there any questions on calculating income based upon pay stubs and benefit letters? Hey, Kathy, it's Jose again. Yep. Can you go back to the PDF real quickly? Because I want to have it on record so my staff hear this out um, and it's recorded. Uh, if the PDF, if you have it of any one of oh them. Oh, yeah, I can get to it really easy. Yeah. So it's important to note that this over here allows you to jump to any spot within the um, calculation that you need. So what page do you need me yeah. on? There, right there. Perfect. So okay. guys, um, for, for uh, my staff, do not put the first name. We spoke about this on our training that we did last week. We are using only the members IDs. We have our uh, numbering system. So again, um, I know Kathy said you can and it's not required. I'm telling you guys, do not put it in. Again, you only will fill out the member ID. So I want things to be consistent um, with, our with our naming convention and protect PII. So even though it's allowable, I'm telling you, do not put any first name, just put the member IDs. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. OK. All right, so we're going to go back to our dashboard. And then I just want to walk through a calculation using the 1040, the IRS 1040. So again, I am always going to start up here. CDBG disaster recovery, start. Again, I'm going to use the same income amount, um, so I am going to go low mod. So this beneficiary is going to be HRRP for the sake of this O2. And in this case, we're only going to have one household member. Okay. So again, the beneficiary ID, I would probably do O2 dash head of household members the head of household um and we're going to leave it just just that you know it's not over 62 uh well actually yeah they're over 62 they're working a part-time job not disabled so again we're going to go through georgia brunswick we believe this person is under 80 percent We are not looking at housing, low income housing tax credits. And we are going to select the IRS 1040 adjusted gross income. Okay, so you'll notice it doesn't even give us the option of guided or short form for this. So this one here now. So what I will say up here is that this message is absolutely correct. They did not update this particular form based upon certain changes that were made to the 2020 IRS form 1040. However, they the IRS 1040, while the line items have changed, the descriptions have not. So if we look at our sample IRS form, the 1040, you'll see wages, salaries, tips. If we come jump back here, we'll see wages, salaries, tips, taxable interest. We come back here, 
tax, you see this taxable interest. So if for some reason you don't have that chart handy or we go, you should not be doing intakes in 2022, but let's say that we have another disaster and you do do them in 2022 or 2023, you can look for the wording because that does not change here on the income calculator. Okay, so in this example, using this here, I am going to put this amount, 20509 into the wages, salaries, and tips, and I am going to put this amount, Social Security benefits, taxable amount, into that line on the income calculator. So, and then you see taxable amount of Social Security benefits, 5100 okay those are the only numbers that were on the ten, that were filled out on the 1040 that apply now there's lots of other numbers down here we don't need to worry about those we only need to worry about ones that match these specific items and we click calculate and once again we come to our export pdf now this looks very different this one simply says that this is the wages, salaries, and tips. This is the taxable amount of Social Security benefits. This is the amount of money that this person earned. And so again, we have our it saying that it is below the 80% income limit. They're good to go. You will again export to PDF. To reiterate what Jose said, we will absolutely not add any names other than the printed name on the signature field. You don't actually don't even, yeah, up here, you would not add their first names, okay? So that is that. Then what we would do once we've exported it is we would save and return to our dashboard. Now, on the off chance that you found out that this person was actually 120% income, you simply click on that number, you come down here, you switch that to urgent need, you wait till you hit the first save button, and you're good to go. Okay? So now to pop back into my PowerPoint. All right. So this is what y'all need to understand about using the income calculator based upon the hrrp manual we wanted to make your lives and the collection of data from the applicants as easy as possible so when hud told us in our federal register that we were able to use the irs form 1040 calculator we said fantastic we'll do that so in that case, if the applicant completed a 2020 tax return at the time of the application, so if you have somebody that comes in today and they have completed their 2020 tax return, you must use the IRS 1040 adjusted gross income calculator. That means you have to obtain a copy of their 2020 IRS 1040. If they have not completed a 2020 tax return, but they did file a 2019 tax return, again, you must use the 1040 Adjusted Gross Income Calculator, and you must obtain a copy of the 2019 IRS Form 1040. Now, let me say that given the pandemic, it is possible that someone's income may have significantly changed since they filed their 2019 tax return. In that case, you must use your best judgment. And if you determine that, you know, maybe in 2019, they made $45,000 a year and they lost their job because of the pandemic and they're coming to you now and they're only just getting back to work and they're making $15,000 a year. You're, it's in their best interest to calculate on their current income. What you need to do is just make a note in their application that that's why you did it. Because based upon the homeowner rehab manual, these two circumstances apply. You must use the most recent tax return filed if they were responsible for filing a tax return, okay? So then again, 
only if the applicant was not responsible for filing a tax return in either year may alternate documentation be collected and the 24 CFR Part 5 annual income calculator be used. Now, given what we've all just talked about, I understand that most of what you're seeing are people who are collecting Social Security benefits as their sole source of income. That means that you're probably going to be using a lot of 24 CFR Part 5 annual income. We understand that. The, uh, the above two bullets are simply saying that if they were responsible for filing a tax return, you should be using the tax return. Okay. And then again, we're just, I want to reiterate the CPD income calculator sheets must be signed prior to uploading in eCivis. They are not valid if they are not signed. And therefore, your application would be returned to you if it were submitted with an unsigned CPD income calculator. Did Kathy have a question? Sure. Um, what if um, what if they didn't do a uh, didn't bring in a 1040? Could you use the 1040 calculator anyway? It would be tough because you wouldn't have the you wouldn't be seeing this information. Right. So but you may see the W two, but you may not, especially when we're talking about Social Security benefits. Even if as someone receive, so, so let's say in this example, this person's working maybe three quarter time. Okay. Right. And so therefore, some of their social security benefits become taxable, but not all of them. Uh -huh. So in this case, when I looked it up, approximately $5,100, you know, I estimated approximately only 5,100 of the 10,700 that they got from social security was actually taxable. So it may be a scenario of them needing to reach out to their tax preparer or if they used uh, if they used one of the online like free file, mm -hmm. they should be able to log into their account and you mm -hmm. should be able to help them print out a copy of the 1040. Okay. If they used tax software on their own computer or maybe their son or their nephew did it for them, um, then the same thing. You can go into that tax software and you, there's there's usually a section where you can just do forms. If all else fails, the you can there is a, a document you can use to request the a copy of the 1040 directly from the IRS, but you are looking at probably a few weeks for that to come out. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. So, <laughs> any questions? So there's no next steps here on income calculation. We covered it all. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. So, hey, Kathy, not not a question, but just a statement um, for my staff, just in case the question is asked. So the, at the bottom of the form, you do have to put the homeowner signature and print the name. So just to make it clear, so you don't put it at the top. But when we're signing the paperwork where the case manager sign as the preparer, you sign and you print your name. The applicant, the co-applicant, um, if they are above 18 years old, they also have to print and sign their documents. So I just want to say it out loud and make it clear. So not on the top, but on the bottom, you do collect signature and print the name. Okay. Well, I will let you determine if that was, you know, they, they, you're welcome to, anyone's welcome to speak up if they understand what Jose is saying um, or have any comments or questions to that. So um, that is the end of my spiel um, for this. The only thing I will say is income calculations, they come with time. Eventually this is going to be second nature, but if you haven't done a lot of these in the past, it can be very easy to get confused, especially when you're looking at pay stubs and social security statements. Oh my goodness. I don't understand why the social security office feels it necessary to put, to put information that should be in one paragraph into six pages. Um, but they do. I think it's just, it's a federal thing. I think they like to make our lives more complicated. 
please know that we are here for any questions. Um, we are doing uh, desk audits of draft applications. Um, we had actually started them last week. However, with the issues that you all were experiencing with eCivis, we stopped. Uh, to de help eCivis deal with the um, problems that have been occurring. We are addressing the issue of the changing locations um, of uploads. We are also addressing the situation where one of your cases was somehow switched to Doherty County. Um, and that is actually at the executive leadership side um, for DCA. So it's not, it's actually gone well above just disaster recovery and has been uh, brought up to executive leadership. So as soon as we have any additional information about that, we will certainly share it with you all. Um, if you continue to experience problems, please don't hesitate to let me know. The only way I can get it fixed is to know about it. So certainly send those send those issues to Roxanne and have her send them to me. Um, you know, as, as Roxanne might have shared, my email to the eCivis team um, that is working with DCA directly right now received a response much quicker than you all are getting one. I am also working on that. I do feel like the response time is a little um, ridiculous, <laughs> to be completely honest. Um, so I am working with them to see what eCivis plans to do about being able to get response time reduced so that you all can get answers quicker. So I would love to be able to give you guys back um, more, more time. I wanted to make sure we had enough time to get through everything, but I am here as well as a couple members of my staff, both Bikin and Cassie are also on. Are there any questions, whether related to the presentations today or not, that I can answer for you all? Cassie, I have one. Okay, Roxanne, and, go ahead. And it's just uh, simple, I think. So could we get, I know we're going to have the recording, but could we also get just copies of the slides that you showed? Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Our, so you'll actually get copies of the slides um, even quicker than the uh, recording awesome. of the meeting. Awesome. I will, as soon as I, um, well, it is actually just about lunchtime, so I, as soon as I get lunch, I will be drafting an email. You will get the slides, you will get all the sample documents, um, and then when the recording comes in, a separate email will go out with that. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Regina, you had originally had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Um, no, ma'am. Ms. Smith answered it. We just asked it for me. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Well, if there's nothing else from anyone, um, I am happy to say we got done about 24 minutes sooner than we anticipated. So I really do appreciate you guys getting on here um, and being able to do this. Jose, go ahead. Sorry. Um, any update from the last conversation about the Harris Law Center? I never saw a response. I don't know if you responded to Roxanne, but I haven't seen anything come my way. Uh, oh, yeah. So I did actually, I spoke with Georgia Air Property Law Center um, and they explained a little bit of what the, um, so they put the title search to their company, out with their company, and they did not receive an accurate response and i'm paraphrasing here i am not using the language they use because they are lawyers they did not receive an accurate response so they had to reissue several of them but they did say that my general um comment that day that was the last time we spoke about the courts being backed up and so the timeline being a little bit longer it was fairly accurate they are experiencing a lot of those issues. The title search company is experiencing those issues, but they are definitely uh, willing to try to speed things up to the extent that they can. Um, and I know that they spoke about a, I think it's a monthly meeting that you all have with them. Is it yeah. a monthly meeting, yeah. Roxanne? And so they said that they, they would certainly, you know, address any concerns directly with you guys as well. 
And Kathy, lastly, um, is there a policy or or possible policy change of why we're not able to use the Georgia Superior Court Clerk's Cooperative Authority search tool for titles? Um, okay. I know the city of Brunswick, um, you know, pays for it. And for example, just as a trial, we trial search in one of our homeowners that were missing titles. And this came out with, you know, the copy of the title, the certify and everything and we could like print it. So I'm not sure if this is acceptable for you guys. So you'd rather wait for us for the uh, Georgia Law Center, but we're kind of able to get it that way. OK, so what I think the important thing to note there is that there is a difference between a deed and a title. Um, I, I'm not going to try to explain the difference because, as I said, I'm not a lawyer. I don't do this for a living and I don't play one on TV. Um, so I don't want to try to explain the legalities behind it. But there is a difference between a deed and a title. Now, in a circumstance, so what I did tell Roxanne is that because um, Georgia Air Property Law Center does already subscribe for deed searches to what you just said, the Georgia blah 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 um they are willing to do those deed searches they had made this offer previously to another sub recipient um that so they're willing to do those deed searches what i did say is that de disaster recovery so the hrrp funds could not pay for a subscription to that you guys are welcome to use it understanding that I would like Roxanne or all of you or some of you, someone to have a conversation with Georgia Air Property Law Center so they can explain the difference between a deed and a title and what the difference is. If you have someone sitting in front of you that is the sole owner of a home and you pull up a deed and that's literally what it says, you are probably good to move forward. But in cases where we need to talk about title, it, there, there's nuances that I'm not comfortable explaining myself. I would be happy to be part of a phone call with Georgia Air Property Law Center to go through that. Uh, and we could certainly set something like that up. I just, I know that I don't know enough about it. No, no, no. And I, and I get that. And I think it's, let me rephrase it, not a title, but like you said, we have some cases that we have searched. And for example, I put your, your name, for example, just as a thing, and I came out clearly it says, yes, Kathleen has a deed to house 123 Main Street since 1990. And it's like clear certified copy and everything. So that, that was my question. If it's a clear document that states what is on the HRRP manual, I, I was just wondering if we could kind of use it or at least submit it with the paperwork to you guys. So just to try to like, you know, yeah, if you, if you can bit. clearly delineate ownership with that deed, then yes, you don't need to go through a title search. Not every property is going to require a title search. It's the properties where you have uh, Jane Doe comes in and says, yep, I own the house at 1234 Main Street, and you pull that deed, or she you know, maybe brings you a copy of the deed herself, and it actually says that Jane Doe, John Doe, Jesse Doe, and Anna Doe are the actual owners of the home. Uh, or maybe her name's not on there at all. So those are circumstances. But when you feel that you you can justify that, yes, this person is the, is the owner of the home or this applicant couple is the owner of the home, clearly by a deed, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions that I can answer for anyone? No. All right. Well, then, like I said, thank you very, very much for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions that come up after this, you know, as usual, just send them through Roxanne. She'll get them to me or Rakeen, and we will get back to you as quickly as possible. Um, and I guess I'd say have a great day. So what's your weather like down there, Roxanne? Are you rainy, too? It looks like it might go that way. It's overcast. 
I'm uh, okay. the dogs so, yeah, we're, we're, we're we've it. been rainy since about two o'clock this morning. So, nice. so enjoy the weather while it lasts, and we will uh, speak again soon. I am sure. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, thanks everyone. All. Thank you all. Thank you.